the, in the rest of the world, which obviously, depending on which country you're in, was extremely different. Um, I talk a bit about China, I talk a fair amount about New Zealand, just because that's where my sister was, which was like the place where the, the, the disease wasn't. And people got, you know, very um, focused in, on, on the virus in places where it wasn't, China, New Zealand, Australia, Vietnam. Um, and where it was, we kind of like as a society moved on from it amazingly quickly that you know it was unthinkable in 2019 if i said a pandemic is going to hit it's going to kill a million and a million americans everyone will be like well that's going to you know hollow out society in in some terrible way and in fact somehow we became okay with it and there are still a uh, lot of Americans who are not okay with it, who are still very worried about the disease, who think that we're doing a terrible job of protecting our citizens from it. We're still in a world where a thousand Amer Americans a week are dying of it. Um, so, you know, epidemiologically it's bad, but economically it's basically dis disappeared. Societally, it feels like it's over. Um, and And that's like the big... And, and that's like really the, what, the, what the book is about is like the social and, and societal effects of the pandemic. And I think the thesis of the book is that they're enormous, that they're, we're going to be feeling them for at least a decade, probably much more. Um, the, you know, if the effects of the Second World War we felt for, you know, 30, 50, 70 years afterwards, like this is not maybe quite that big, but almost. Um, and the reason is, is because it had that incredible sort of breakage and then rebuild something new um, period of time in 2020, 2021. And I talk a lot about how things changed around then. You know, in contradistinction, say, to the 1918 pandemic, which kind of was, was barely even noticed at the time. You know, because people were much more used to infectious diseases, they happened much more frequently. Was uh, and and it came on the tail of the First World War, which was much more you know top of mind. Um, the way that you think about something is is actually more important than just like ticking off the numbers of, of people who died. Um, that said, you know some of the numbers are, are truly terrible, and I do try to remind people about you know mortality and also just the increase in global poverty. There was a while inequality went down, domestically it went up internationally. And there's um, the, the broad thesis of the book, I call it the new not normal, is that we are in a much more volatile world with much fatter tails, much bigger upsides, much bigger downsides. Um, and, and we're going to have both simultaneously. There's an increase in risk and in risk taking, and that's going to pay off to the upside and to the downside. Um, there was crazy stuff happening. Like during the pandemic was the first time ever that we saw an increase in smoking. I, I talk about um, like uh, one, another weird thing that happened was that people stopped wearing seat, seat belts, especially like men. For some reason, like there was like this mass, like there was this huge increase in mortality among like 18 to 25 year old men, none of which basically had, was, was directly a cause of COVID. But like, all these other things like seatbelt deaths and opioid deaths and gun deaths all went up. Um, and that's the risk taking. And, 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 you know, obviously there's a lot of downside to risk, but there's a lot of upside to risk taking as well. And I think we're, we're beginning to see, we, we are seeing that in the stubbornly high um, employment figures that we still see every month. Um, and, and in the consumer, in the retail spending numbers that came out this morning. Um, and yeah, and I think that, this sort of high volatility world that we find ourselves in where we have to expect the unexpected and you can't just assume that you can take some grand sort of strategic vision and stick with it for decades and it's going to pay off sort of Warren Buffett style. Um, yeah, that kind of period of post-war stability is over and now we're in a very much more volatile world. But yeah, I'll leave it to Charles to poke holes in all of this. Well, thanks. I'll, I'll try and briefly poke a hole or two, and then let you all poke holes too. Um, thank you. Uh, that, that, uh, that was fascinating, and it is. It is a. It is a fascinating book, um, and does remind one of 
of what the world was like in a way that I, I realized I was already forgetting. Um, and, and, and that's just odd uh, uh, how much we do put it in the rearview mirror. Um, I guess maybe it's because I'm team endemic rather than team pandemic. Uh, I, I have to be a bit you know, down on the idea that, 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 that everything's changed. Um, uh, uh, the, you know, the big killers in history aren't, aren't plagues. It's, it's, it's things that tend to hang around for a long time, like smallpox and measles and, and so on. You know, they're, they're the underappreciated horrors of history. Um, and, and, and pandemics get all the glory, but they're, 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 they're not really. Yeah, why couldn't they have been the Black Death, honestly? Right, quite. Uh, um, and, and, and so partly sort of is in, in that spirit, you know, I wonder if this has changed the direction of things all that much. And, um, you know, so one, one way of thinking about that uh, is, is you in the book, and, and, and I, you know, for, for, for good reason, talk about some sort of social and economic, some large social and economic changes that seem to have started during the pandemic, maybe because we're sitting in Washington and, you know, we all think about institutions. None of that happened pretty much during the pandemic. Institutional change was pretty pathetic. Okay, Kovacs, thank you. But... Um, uh, Kovacs so, was a clear baby. Well, so, yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> and it's the best we got. We've been, yeah. um, uh, 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 it, it, at least it wasn't the success we all hoped, put it that way. Uh, well, I mean, like, to, by, by, the, step, by the, the original idea of Kovacs, if, we, if you remember, and again, like, as I say, we forget everything, but the original idea of Kovacs was that it would be a global allegation mechanism for vaccines. And then when that clearly failed, when the Americans and the Brits and everyone were like, there's absolutely no way we're going to just like take our place in line and let Kovacs decide when we get our vaccines, then it, they kind of like, you know, there was a fallback position of like, well, maybe we can just use Kovacs for you know, the developing world and stuff. But like by its original goal, right. it wouldn't uh, come close. Thank you for making my case. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and that's the sort of the best example we have. We've come out of this pandemic. Um, at least the last administration managed to get a World Bank capital increase. This one seems to be failing even at that as a part of a response to you know, new global challenges or indeed you know, cleaning up the pandemic and, and some of the mess it's left behind in mm -hmm. debt. Mm -hmm. we, we've, we've seen sort of pretty much no change in the direction on things like the World Trade Organization. You know, this administration is ripping it apart as fast as the last one was. You know, a lot of the, the sort of slightly worrying uh, uh, um, institutional changes we were seeing nationally and globally don't seem to have reversed all that much. The, the, right. the IRA, which we all thought was going to be about uh, climate change, turns out to be a badly uh, targeted subsidy program for inefficient US industry. You know, there's just not too much to hope for out there when it comes to, to institutions of government, at least. So yes, um, agreed. Uh, while, while we have this kind of you know, potentially uh, some, 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 some nice signs uh, um, when it comes to sort of social and economic change. Are you not worried they could just be stymied, overcome, uh, collapse under the weight of what's going on down the street? Uh, yes, no, I'm, I'm deeply worried about that. <laughs> and, and, and you're right to be worried about that. And I would say that um, the, what, one of the things I do talk about in the book is the way in which plagues and pandemics over the long term actually feed into authoritarianism as opposed to pluralism. Um, there's a fascinating paper which I cite and I've forgotten who wrote it already because I, you know, we, we forget everything. But um, but the yeah the past three years did coincide with a lot of really quite terrifying stuff in Hungary and Poland and Turkey and Brazil and, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, there was a, and still is a institution, a crisis of institutions happening, not only in the United States, but globally. Um, I have a whole chapter about the institution that is the US dollar and how that um, kind of got weakened in interesting ways. Um, it like, or it was a bunch of, in a weird way, it was like political capital that had been built up over the over the years and then got spent. Um, 
in interesting ways. But the dollar is weaker than it used to be, um, just as an institution. The yeah, no, I think and and the grand, you know, Bretton Woods institutions of that we're all surrounded by here are showing their age. Um, and they all are part of that post-World War II stability and order that I kind of say, like, basically, we've lost now. Like, we're, we're now post that. And so there is going to be more volatility. There is going to be more chaos. We're not going to be able to just, you know, invent some multinational organization which is going to be able to make things better. And insofar as things do get better, it's, it's going to be in the sort of chaotic, ground-up way um, rather than because a bunch of technocrats make a bunch of really good decisions and have the weight of um, sovereigns behind them. Well, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, sitting in a think tank, I have to say, that's terrible. Um, but, okay. I, I, um, I guess a sort of a, 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 a follow-up. That said, I will, I will say one little bright spot, which I also mentioned, is... U.S. fiscal policy turned out to be amazing to the astonishment of like most people. Again, something we we couldn't have predicted, and so like the ability of this incredibly broken and dysfunctional America, which is horribly bifurcated and no one can agree on anything, to get you know five trillion dollars worth of stimulus out of the door in the space of two years, was nothing short of astonishing like we did not expect that we did not see that coming and because it happened it was great for the u.s economy it was great for the global economy um and and yeah well done steve nishin <laughs> <laughs> um by the way on the fiscal thing there uh, a fascinating part of the book is uh, is on cash transfers and how well they work um music to ears of some of the people in this room but um uh, you mentioned the risk taking which as you say you know is something that sort of pops up in 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 moments when people are very uh, aware of disease risk uh, uh, or just aware of, of, of risk of life in general that ironically makes them want to take more risks because it's like well i'm going to die tomorrow anyway so i might as well try this um, and they all start jumping out of planes without parachutes um you also mentioned um the uh, sort of the localization effect maybe of, of pandemics is one way yep. to put it um, um and there's a sort of Flip side to that, which is the uh, uh, fact that when people are thinking about diseases, they tend to be more racist, uh, more nativist, uh, uh, more you know closed off to, to to foreigners. You know, something that apes do the same thing. I mean, this has been around for for for, for yeah. For, this, forever. this this paper, by the way, which I cite in the book, I totally like grab from a footnote in Charles's book, <laughs> which but it's amazing that apes, you know, when uh, Noah ape wants to join the tribe, they basically put that ape through quarantine and a very painful and nasty quarantine where most apes that want to join the tribe fail and wind up either leaving or dying. Um, it's uh, deeply, you know, pre-human instinct. That, that we have, and we saw it flare up um, in so many different ways um, in 2020. You know, we saw the American, like the way the U.S. would refuse to allow Europeans, and even when Europe, even when Europe had like less COVID than the U.S., you know, it made no sense. But on the sort of logical level, but it made every sense in terms of just this atavistic fear of the other that happens during times of um, plague, and those borders, once they go up, come down much more slowly. So we are going to be a much more localized, regionalized world. You know, we're in a post-global world. I think, no, you know, this is, this is uh, uncontroversial at this point. Um, and I think, you know, it is, as I say, mostly uh, on, focused on the US. Um, this is probably good for the US. You know, the US is this continent-sized economy that is actually, you know, it doesn't have lots of internal borders that need to be um, circumvented. So from an American perspective, like, I think I think there's, uh, there's reason to hope that we can see a, a bunch of, like, interesting regional phoenixes rise from, rise from the COVID ashes. From a global perspective, I would agree with Charles. If 
this is what you're saying, that it looks less optimistic right now. Yeah, I mean, so it's the combination of the the the, the risk appetite and the sort of the short termism you talk about, uh, uh, shortening our perspective in terms of time and the the nativism and so on, shortening our perspective in terms of distance. When you put those two things together, I think they are really bad for two things we care about here. One of which is development, and the other of which is climate, um, because you know climate is a pretty long-term problem and yeah. if our perspective has become uh, much more immediate the chances that we're going to make investments uh, to deal with this long-term problem probably go down and see, I, possibly yeah. also pandemics because you know <laughs> there might be another one along in a while but there will be i mean we, we, we're sure there's going to be another one it's not going to be another hundred years before the next one uh, so in, in in all of these cases you know uh, why aren't you more miserable <laughs> um so the thing that was really surprising, and again, it's, it's hard to go back and remember the, the pre-pandemic world and how different it was, but when the world just stopped in March 2020, that was unprecedented. We'd never seen anything like it. And what we saw was, to a first approximation, every single government of every single country in the world collectively deciding for the sake of humanity to impose these lockdowns, standstills. You know, there was differences between them, but it was basically the same decision globally. The world stopped, everyone stayed at home, and we all came together collectively to work in concert with each other globally, six billion people around the world, to you know, bend the curve to buy ourselves time to develop the therapeutics, to develop the vaccines, to, you know, and all of this kind of thing. And it was an incredibly hopeful moment for people who care about the climate because the number one issue with when it comes to the climate is global collective action. And obviously, global, the kind of global collective action that we need in order to solve the climate crisis is not exactly the same and it doesn't have the same degree of urgency. But at least we have a proof of concept. So that is one little bit of, you know, optimism I have. Fair enough. Um, but your point about discount rates is well taken, right? Like, and, and uh, you know, implicit discount rate has followed, you know, the Fed, really, hasn't it? It's gone up. And so <laughs> we do care. We are, you know, we are more short-sighted than we used to be. And I write about this in... Uh, chapter about investing as well you know that when you know we gen x's were brought up in this world of like we should invest for the long term and then in 30 or 40 years you'll have lots of money when you retire and then you know the the, the winter of 2020 come one comes around and suddenly like the only thing that matters in investing is am i going to 100x my money in the space of three weeks and it's a very different it's it's um I, I stole a phrase from kevin roos at the new york times like it's people are looking for trampolines not ladders um and that's risk-taking and you know always there's there's two sides to the risk-taking coin okay i have moaned on enough questions questions Someone, just press your little button in front of you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know awesome. that you know that you know how this works. Oh, yeah. All right, I'll go. Um, interesting to hear both of you on this. I guess I, what you just described as global collective action. I I wonder. I think a lot about the U.S. China dynamic. So I, I'm probably grappling with a few ill-formed questions here, but it does seem to me you know that that was. You could maybe call it global coincidental action, but I don't think of, you know, I, I certainly, you didn't see cooperative behavior, particularly when it comes to the two largest economies in the world. That's for sure. So I'm not sure I'm so comforted that a bunch of nations sort of decided, you know, the same things in terms of their self-interest versus you know, if you take the comparison of, say, the global financial crisis, where you clearly saw cooperation, um, U.S., China, more broadly. Um, well, you didn't see U.S.-China cooperation in the financial crisis. You saw, like, G7 cooperation. 
No, but I, I mean, I think there was certainly the central banks. I mean, there was lines of communication, all that. I I guess I'm I'm just really struck in trying to understand how this pandemic pandemic. I mean, did the pandemic matter at all for the U.S.-China relationship? I mean, it was already on this trajectory. Did it yeah, accelerate no, it was, anything? Yeah, no, it was how it was terrible. Um, yeah, there's a. There's a case to be made. I, I wouldn't necessarily make this case myself. But I've definitely heard it made, and I, I wouldn't dis necessarily disagree. Is that the pandemic um, that we had? We meaning the sort of pandemic technocrats had the ability to to nip this one in the bud. You know, if the CDC and the NIH and all these people had managed to come into Wuhan like when it was discovered in China and the Chinese had been more open and the, you know we managed to use the global expertise that we had in terms of pandemics um, to, to really try and stop it from spreading, then maybe it wouldn't have become this global catastrophe that it became. Um, and obviously, you know, that whole organization had been dismantled by Trump and Trump had no interest in dealing with the Chinese and China had no interest in dealing with the Americans. And, you know, and the mutual mistrust, which was, um, you know, accelerated by Trump going around calling it the China virus, you know, was, um, was terrible. And yeah, that was not some beautifully cooperative, co cooperative um thing where we like closed down in concert with each other to help fight the virus now you're right it was it was largely selfish um and the many decades of us china cooperation in terms of like uh mutual the mutually beneficial relationship they had economically has now become much more adversarial and will remain much more adversarial for the foreseeable future. And we, you know, so yeah, I'm not going to pretend that's good. The climate problem is also a, a problem for each country that at a certain point could come to a head for everyone so that they might selfishly at the same time individually decide. The same principles could operate, I would say, right? That operated in the pandemic, theoretically, right? <sighs> You see, I, I think I think that's where my 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 limits of optimism run out. <laughs> you know, because it's it's not. Yeah, I'm. I'm broadly. It's actually interesting. I think maybe I'm slightly more optimistic about this than I used to be. Because here's another thing, which surprised me, and this pandemic was full of surprises. And this is a pandemic, um, I write in the book about like this sort of. Uh, kind of epistemic uncertainty that we just find ourselves having to change our minds over and over again about things. Um, but yeah, one of the things that happened um, in February 2022 was that Russia invaded Ukraine and everyone was like, oh shit, Europe is really fucked because they're going to, Russia's going to cut off the gas supplies and then Europe's not going to have any gas and that's going to be catastrophic. Um, and the gas kept on flowing for a while until it didn't. Um, and we saw, you know, insane gas prices in Europe and everything looked like it was going to a very bad place. And then somehow the sun rose the following morning, right? And the amount of gas that Europe used went down substantially, that Germany in particular found ways to get by um, on with much less gas. And, and while also sh shutting down all of its nuclear power stations at the same time, I mean, it's kind of amazing what they did, but like the Germans just kind of did what you said, right? And they said like, okay, we have this, um, energy crisis that has befallen our country, what are we going to do about it? We're going to put on an extra sweater and we're going to be like a little bit colder this winter. <laughs> and they got through it, you know, and it worked. And, you know, the Mittelstand kept on Mittelstanding and they kept on, you know, producing, they, there was, they remained a very productive economy, but 
There was, actually. I'm, I've always been very mistrustful of, like, bottom-up solutions to climate change, you know, of the kind of, like, well, if we need to, if we're going to save the planet and we all need to take fewer air flights or whatever, right? Like, I feel like those things don't generally work very well, but looking at what Germany did, you know, in terms of its, its energy consumption over the past 18 months, I'm like, well, maybe it does work. Maybe the, all those like individual decisions, you know, we can wind up in those mindsets and we can really move like the climate needle, just like, you know, in, in that kind of a way. So again, like without being a raging optimist about, well, the whole world is going to start moving to heat pumps. Um, I do think that, again, the world has surprised me, um, especially if you look at what happened to Europe um, in, the, in the wake of the Ukraine invasion, has surprised me about how much it can do and how quickly it can do it. Jerry. Felix, I'm, I'm interested in how you see the relation between the response to COVID and the response to the 2008 financial crisis. Um, when you look backwards at both of them, one of the striking things to me is how little the financial crisis changed uh, by comparison to the pandemic, right? The financial crisis didn't change the way, didn't break the way we think about time, space, right. fiscal policy, trade, money, uh, efforts right. to radically rethink things at that time were largely met with pushback quickly and effectively. Yet 12 years later, when the pandemic came around, efforts to think differently, as, as you, you, your book points out, in response to the pandemic were like pushing on an open door. Mm -hmm. um, so much so that um, perhaps your argument could be taken uh, as portraying Steve Mnuchin as the heir to Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you understand the relationship between the two events? Are, are there uh, deep under the surface connections between the financial crisis and 2020? Uh, could some of the innovations of the pandemic era have come earlier after the financial crisis? And if so, might that have avoided some political instability of the intervening period? So I, yeah, I mean, the the big and lasting consequence of the financial crisis, um, from my perspective, was the electoral um, earthquakes of 2016. First, the Brexit vote and then the Trump vote. Um, uh, both of which I think would never have happened absent the financial crisis. The financial crisis created this sort of up swelling of um, not just uh, mistrust in institutions, but a feeling of like just the whole world being rigged against us to a point at which we may as well just burn the whole thing down. Um, and I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right that if we had attacked the Great Recession with the full armory that we wheeled out when in COVID that would have prevented um, a large amount, a, a certain amount of that anger. I, it's hard to um, be too certain about those kind of counterfactuals. And I'm definitely hyper conscious of the fact that the Tea Party was created as a result of a rant on CNBC by Rick Santelli, who was complaining about the big the bailout of homeowners being too big, right? That like he was like already anti-fiscal largesse at that point. And that but even, even knowing that, I think you're right that if the if we if we hadn't been so kind of stuck in a pre two thousand eight paradigm in two thousand eight two thousand nine, and we'd been a little bit more imaginative, a la 2020, 2021, in terms of how to react to that crisis, 
um, we would have been in a much better place in the, over the next five years. 2016 wouldn't have happened. And yeah, yeah, I, I think that is the big difference, right? Is that there was something more immediately traumatic perhaps about COVID than, than the financial crisis. The financial crisis always felt like it was, it wasn't happening to us so much as it was like something that the banks did. Um, I don't know, but I think I think your point is very well taken that, that we have a new crisis playbook now. And uh, if we'd had this playbook in 2008, we would be in a better place. By the same token, though, you know, I don't think we would have been quite so quick or quite so smart in 2020 if we didn't already have a bunch of, you know, the, the first thing the Fed did, does in 2020 is it pull dusts off the 2008 monetary policy playbook and you get all of the zero interest rates and the QE and the forward guidance and all of that kind of stuff. It's like, it's automatic. They're like, well, we did that last time. We'll do it this time. Right. And people forget how long it took to put that together in 2008. You know, that wasn't just sitting on the shelf back then. The fact that it was on the shelf in 2020 meant you could implement it much more quickly. And that really helped. So 20, 2008 helped in terms of the speed of the monetary policy response, certainly. Um, but yeah, certainly in terms of fiscal, it was, you know, maybe we learned our lesson, perhaps. I was actually going to ask exactly, did we overlearn that lesson? And uh, how do you think of the political economy of large scale fiscal stimulus in the next crisis, whatever form that crisis takes? Has the inflation that has followed undermined yeah. uh, that capacity? So that, I mean, that, that's the terrifying one, right? Is, is that like, we we have we have the fiscal playbook now, and are we going to just be too afraid to use it, or too politically dysfunctional to use it? Was there this weird confluence, like this weird sort of like Nixon in China thing of Trump being president? Um, the, I mean, I, I am I am definitely highly cognizant of the fact that the kind of a super aggressive fiscal policy we saw in the U.S. was not matched almost anywhere else, right? And so, and you kind of imagine that if anyone's gonna be doing that, you know, you get like the French, you know, that's what the French do, they spend lots of money, right? But they didn't. And, and the French were much more fiscally conservative than the Americans. And I'm like, well, if they can't do it, what hope is there that the Americans will do it next time around? The universal uh, received opinion at this point is that the inflation is entirely a function of like too much fiscal and, and that therefore the lesson is that we did too much fiscal we mustn't um, make that mistake again um, I've been trying to make the point that the inflation that we're seeing right now was a calculated risk you know, the, the Biden administration was very clear and said over and over and over again that the risks of doing too much are great, uh, smaller than the risks of doing too little. And the risks of doing too much are basically what we're seeing right now. You know, we have some inflation and we're trying to deal with it. And the risks of doing too little are you get another five year long, you know, great recession like we had after 2008. And I think objectively, it, we're, we're in a much better place now than. We were in, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, in that long, painful recovery from 2008. And so, yeah, I think given that, sure, we, we took that calculator. It's impossible to calibrate these things exactly. And we did a little bit too much, and that's still better than doing too little. But I don't think anyone politically has, has been able to make that argument. I uh, just wanted to ask you about the issue of trust in institutions that um, and what took place over the, the pandemic. Um, there was a Pew poll out today that uh, the number of American adults who support MMR vaccines in schools is now, uh, uh, it's like, it was like 16% were opposed, now it's almost 30% as a mandatory thing. And I'm just wondering how that would impact, you know, this type of lack of faith and trust in the system. How, how do you how, how deep is that 
how much scarring really is there and what impact do you expect that to have going forward? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's the, I don't, I don't think that the pandemic caused the lack of trust in institutions, but certainly it was something that was seized upon by the sort of burn it all down crowd. Um, and there, and it's very depressing to me that the left right division in the United States wound up seizing on the vaccines in particular as a point of disagreement. And they were like, you know, the 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 leftist soy boys were all like, you know, injecting themselves with Bill Gates's computer chips and the and, and the and the right wing ones were like anti-vax and so on. And that, which is which is again like again, something that we would not have expected, right? Given that if you look at every measles outbreak in the pre-pandemic era, um, if you wanted to predict, you know, where was the next outbreak going to be? The thing you did was you pulled up a map of Whole Foods stores and you just like went to the rich liberal enclaves where where the anti-GMO crowds would like send their kids to Montessori schools and that's where you got the anti-vax um, centers of outbreaks. Um, and then when an actual pandemic hits, the truly dangerous um, anti-institutional, anti-vax thinking starts coming from the right, not from the left. Again, like this was not expected, right? But there is a, a, trust, a, a crisis of trust in institutions. So I, I've been saying since long before the pandemic that if you tried to put fluoride in the nation's drinking water today, if you try to iodize, you know, table salt today, like you would get absolutely nowhere. It would be completely impossible. The whole concept of public health seems to have gone straight out the window. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I'm not going to try and sugarcoat that one. I, th I think you're absolutely <laughs> right that it's um, it's super dangerous. But Charles knows more about um, public, a lot more about public health than I do. And the way and, and the ways of, you know, trying to bring populations around um, I think also just part of it is, 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 um, urgent, like when you see the disease coming straight towards you, you know, at some point you lose your, um, political uh, beliefs and you just try and protect yourself. So we saw this in New Zealand and we saw this in China that both countries found it very difficult to get vaccination uptake until the disease really started spreading. And then everyone was like, shit, I better get vaccinated, right? And everyone's like, I'm not getting vaccinated. I'm not getting vaccinated. Oh shit, my neighbor just got COVID. I'm going to get vaccinated. Um, so yeah, maybe we just need a few more measles outbreaks and suddenly that number will come down. It was, we were unlucky and um, lots of us, including me, were, were were sending out a false message when the vaccine first came along that you know people who took the vaccine would not get COVID. Right. Um, and I think uh, that also you know that also helps um, 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 depress trust. Um, I don't know, remember herd immunity. Well, yeah, I know, but uh, um, um, you know, but, but but with a lot of the vaccines in the in the standard regimen, you take the vaccine, you really don't get. It your chances of getting the disease dropped to almost zero right. and with COVID that really didn't happen and we were all kind of assuming it would work the same way when I say we I mean you know public health officials were assuming it was going to work the same way and it didn't and I I, I think that probably did you know combined with the fact that you know by then lots of people did have herd immunity so when they did get it it wasn't I mean so it did have did have 
previous experience of COVID. Uh, so when they got it, it wasn't as bad for most of them as it was the first time. And then the vaccine wasn't as good as we said it was, you know, sort of it, the, the line between vaccinated and unvaccinated became, while still very large and everybody should get the vaccines, um, uh, uh, smaller than we might have predicted. And, and, the and the other thing which is really worth mentioning is that we made leaps and bounds in terms of therapeutics. And like it, it's one of the great unsung triumphs of the medical profession is not is like the mRNA vaccines fucking awesome love them but the way that we treat this disease we learn so much so quickly you know no one's on ventilators anymore you know and that ability to learn how to treat it was it saved millions of lives it was incredible. Maybe you can talk a little bit about information and social media in driving all of those individual efforts to seek information to protect themselves. And I mean, is there something we could think about these other kinds of areas where we imagine that there will be these decentralized problems that everyone faces at the same time and what the response is? We got a lot of hits, by the way. I mean, the COVID was great for our organization as a share of information mm -hmm. and obviously the media too. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that. What happened in 2020 and 2021 was that we reinvented the economy from something that happened largely in person to something that happened largely intermediated by screens. Um, another thing that happened is that we left the Google world of everyone can find out any fact they want just by like asking Google and then the fact is there in front of them and entered a much more like epistemically fractured world of facts changing all the time and a lot of things we just don't know. and. The result of those two forces was that people ended up basically crowdsourcing their worldview using whatever social network they were on at the time, which, you know, very large chance it was playing Fortnite with their friends, right? Like, you know, it was, you know, video, video games became a vector for information. Everything became a, a vector for information. Um, and those vectors became extremely strong. They drove the stock market during the winter of 2021. You know, there were all of these meme stocks and cryptocurrencies and stuff like that that were entirely a function of these um, Inf social information sources becoming much more powerful than the standard, you know, copper-bottomed institutional governments and mainstream media and all the rest of it that that we Gen Xers have grown to, you know, trust. Um, so obviously, you're going to wind up in that situation with a much broader range of views and a bunch of um, peculiar filter bu bubbles and you know, QAnon conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers, and there's going to be a whole bunch of like weird stuff that you're, you're not going to have central authority figures to the same degree. You know, so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's part of the volatility of, of new not normal, for sure. Like, and, and, and it's, again, it's one of these things where it's really easy to see the downside of that. But there are, hidden between, behind there, there are, there, I'm sure there are upsides too. <laughs> well, because while we didn't have public health measures in the United States, people actually protected themselves and reduced spread because they were getting information from other sources. Right. So. Um, you mentioned at the beginning kind of that we should all be surprised that a million Americans could die and we'd eventually kind of move on. Um, and I know there's a little bit of literature on that and like for whom the bell tolls and what kinds of deaths shock the public consciousness. But do you have a theory now on how, I mean, an answer to your question, like if it was a war with China, clearly we'd, you know, upturn our political system at a thousand deaths, you know, what uh, disease is different, but 
I would have thought if it's limited to certain socioeconomic groups, but th this was pretty widespread. Like, what, what's your theory of how a million Americans die? And and the Phoenix economy seems downstream from us just kind of accepting that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, part of the, I would say, weirdly, it was almost like a necessary precondition for, for rebuilding this um, economy. Voice from the ashes, please. Yeah, you've got to have ashes, right. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, a necessary precondition is, is that we um, don't care about it anymore. Um, and the point I make in the book is that well, is twofold. One is that the absolute quantum, the number of deaths, is almost irrelevant. Um, the number that everyone keeps on using, like you know, you know how like whenever anyone talks about some land mass in the development, you know, they're always like, this is so many times the size of Rhode Island, right? Like Rhode Island is this weird unit of measurement. Um, the, the, the unit of measurement that we use when it comes to mortality events is 9-11. Um, and that's, what was that, 3,100 people, something like that, died in 9-11. And everyone's like, yeah, more people have died, blah, blah, since uh, then 9-11. So the reason we use 9-11 is because we had, you know, a decade's worth of wars and all manner of you know, trillions of dollars of spending and all manner of deaths in Iraq and all the rest of it, you know, as a result of this one event that killed, relatively speaking, relative to, you know, any number of opioid deaths or whatever you want to use as a comparator, a, com a comparison, like, you know, relatively few deaths. And we took that one very seriously. And the... Um, the way I describe it in the book is this concept of P1. Um, Jeff Zucker understood this really well when he was running CNN, is that at any given point in time, there is really only one thing that the American public can care about. And it could be a really dumb thing, right? It could be, it could be like a missing plane. Right. But if it's a missing plane, then like this is all we're going to cover for like, you know, 24 seven for weeks is some random plane that's gone missing in the Pacific. And why are we covering it? We don't know. But we have just like this is P1. Right. And then if it's a dumb thing like a missing plane, it comes, it goes and then we forget it. So it's no big deal. Right. Um, the 9-11 attacks were P1 for months and they dominated our consciousness and that's what really caused the that their power their geopolitical power was because the length of time they they, they sat in that p1 position the the covid was p1 basically from march 2020 to february 2022 it was two full years the only thing that knocked covid off that p1 position um, we, there was a, an election in the middle of it, which kind of did, but even the election was still dominated by COVID. Um, the only thing which really ended COVID's reign as P1 was the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and if you are at P1 for two solid years like that, then that is going to have enormous long-term repercussions. And it, yeah, and, and it's that length of time and the degree to which it just you know, as they say, lives rent free in your head, that is ultimately determinative, not the number of people who die. Um, the the follow-up question I'd like to ask, if there was time, is how do we make Ida replenishment P1? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe another time. Um, uh, I'd say I'm, I'm optimistic because I actually think what Felix uh, is writing about Dare I say is more important uh, than than, than uh, our institution. Than Ida replenishment? No, nothing is <laughs> nothing, nothing is more important than uh, Ida I mean, and, and I think climate is a good example that the global community has constantly failed to do anything that's strong and legally binding, and yet we keep on smashing all records with you know new solar power all that and so on. The, 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 sort of the, the world goes on without global institutions. <laughs> But it would go on better if they were working better, just to say, you know, to any point yeah. listening. Um, but thank you, uh, Felix. Uh, uh, as, you'll know, as you'll notice, there is also a, a subtle uh, part of the, 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 the cover suggesting that uh, the Liberal Democrats can do very well. And they, 
next UK <laughs> election, uh, 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 another forecast in the book. It is a fantastic read. Do go out and buy it. Do go out and buy it. If, if, you, if you are not going to go out and buy it, there's a box of books over there. So just like pick one up. If you take a, one from over there in the box, buy one for a friend. Exactly. Um, uh, but, but Felix, thank you very much. Felix and I are going to go off for a drink at Bocaria after this. Uh, thank you to Neil. Thank you to Neil. Uh, uh, it would be great uh, if, if uh, anyone could join us. Um, otherwise, I think there is nothing else to do. Thank you for coming. <laughs>